Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Nashers 360 Speaker Series. I'm Curator of Education, Anna Smith, and today I'm pleased to introduce exhibition artist Tom Sachs. I've spoken with a lot of people who find the Nasher to be a restorative space, and indeed, Ray Nasher's urban oasis provides the perfect surroundings for a sublime, meditative, or enlightening encounter with art. This fall, Tom Sachs has taken that experience a step further, transforming the upstairs galleries into a handcrafted tea garden that merges ritual with playfulness, while managing to avoid what the artist has described as the cringe-lined road to whimsy. <laughs> Sachs's work has been exhibited widely in the U.S. and abroad and has been collected by the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Centre Georges Pompidou, the San Francisco Museum of, of Modern Art, and the Astrup Fernley Museet for Moderna Kunst Oslo. The artist's recent solo exhibitions include the Park Avenue Armory, the Noguchi Museum, the Brooklyn Museum, and the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, San Francisco. Concurrent with this exhibition at the Nasher, Spironi Westwater in New York will present an exhibition of sculptures by Sachs called Objects of Devotion, the artist's interpretation of Wunderkammern, on view through October 28th of this year. Joining Sachs in conversation is Nasher Chief Curator Jed Morse, who has been with our institution since its inception and has recently organized major exhibitions featuring Michael Dean, Joel Shapiro, and Veronica Janssens and Giuseppe Pannone. I've really enjoyed hearing Sachs speak about his work throughout the week, so I know you're all in for a really great conversation today. Please join me now in welcoming Tom Sachs and Jed Morse. All right. Well, welcome everyone to another edition of 360, and it's great to have Tom with us here. Um, just a, a little bit of uh, um, uh, some orientation. Um, for those of you who have um, spent time already in the galleries and seen the exhibition, you may not have found everything there is to see. Um, there is uh, quite a bit that meanders throughout the galleries and even out into the garden. And so, um, you know, today we are going to try and talk about everything. Of course, there is the Tea Garden in Gallery One. There are some uh, important early works uh, to, that are about the origins of the tea ceremony um, in the small gallery outside of um, our executive offices. And then there is um, a, a selection of objects from Tom's career that um, look at, his, at the influence of modernism and of course, expounding and expanding on that is Tom's selection of works from the Nasher Collection in Gallery 2. So hopefully we'll be able to get through as, as much of that as possible. But I, I wanted to start um, at the beginning, at least of the tea ceremony material, which of course was the um, Space Program 2.0 Mars performance at the Park Avenue Armory in 2012. And one of, one of the reasons, I'm, I'm glad we can talk about this with images behind us, because it, it, I think it helps give a sense of the enormity of, um, of the task in terms of what it takes to create one of these monumental performances. And it allows me to show the, uh, the LEM. Um, can, you, can you tell us just a, a little bit about I mean, obviously, the space program has a long and storied history within your, your body of work. But, but um, t tell us a little bit about the, um, uh, the enormous um, lunar uh, landing module that you built for this and the space program uh, 2.0 Mars performance. Well, um, we call it a, it is a performance, but internally, we have a swear jar. Every time you say the word performance, <laughs> You got to put a quarter in the jar, but <laughs> um, but we use the word live demonstration of our systems. Oh, okay. Um, but in all external terms, in fact, I was I was there was a review on KQED where they described me as a performance artist, and I felt really honored because there's no higher calling. Um, I mean that. Yeah. And, and um, but our space program is a real space program. We landed on Mars at the Park Avenue Armory 
two women took the first steps that human beings took on the surface of Mars. We, we excavated the 1850 landmark flooring. We, uh, um, better to ask, beg for forgiveness than ask for permission. We ripped up the floorboards and collected moon rocks. Yeah. Those are on display at Sproni Westwater. Um, but if we can just go back for, for yeah, just yeah. for a second, um, this lamb, there are a lot of, if you look on the internet, a lot of, a lot of schmucks have made their own lamb in their backyard for high school production, but only mine and the other NASA, you know, the ones who went onto the moon and Smithsonian <laughs> and stuff, um, have their own lamb that doesn't have a central column where the, the whole weight of it is, is supported by four feet. And I just think it's an important distinction to make because um, that means the thing has to be made exactly right in the way the other ones are made. And it's, it's those details, which we'll get into in the tea ceremony, yeah. that really define the thing. And, and yeah. the details that it would take you days to go through to see, I just, you know, that's my pleasure, is exploring and investigating and building all that. And it, it, it's, we should say that, you know, this is not, um, uh, this is not just a, a sculpture. It's, it's actually used and uh, people enter into it. So the fact that it doesn't have a central column supporting it is significant because um, people actually inhabit that, that module. Um, and then of course you have an enormous um, command center from which you control um, all of this. So it's, the story of, of the Mars mission is, is told from mission control. There are um, 48 screens and then there's a switchboard that puts this, the, the screen that we're looking at at the top, and you can see the, the smaller Earth. So there's the large Earth projected, then there's a smaller one below it, and that, that's a, a video. And then if you look in the upper right, you'll see the, the small surveillance of that same image. And um, it's a camera on a model of a globe on a string on a motor getting closer or farther away. <laughs> one of 48 special effects. So one of the important um, and momentous um, uh, uh, happenings within the mission to Mars is this is where the first tea ceremony took place. So we... So at the other NASA, where I, I did a residency at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in, NASA, in Pasadena, they um, are very careful to scrub their spaceship, their... their um, ships and probes so that when they land on Mars, they don't infect Mars with Earth bacteria. It's called, it's an accord called the Planetary Protection Protocol, and it's taken really seriously by scientists. And my space program, I didn't want to miss the opportunity to represent myself as sort of the darker side of humanity, as imperialists who, you know, go to, from Europe to the New World and infect the Aboriginal people with smallpox or go to um, Argentina and bring back silver and ruin their local economy in, in Europe. Um, I wanted to sort of infect Mars with the best of what humanity has to offer. And it's a huge arguable thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we were talking about the art of the African diaspora as being the most important thing, and it certainly is um, from the American experience. But the tradition of the tea ceremony, the Japanese tea ceremony, which has its roots in China, but the modern tea ceremony, which starts in the 16th century, um, uh, is, is Japanese. And um, this tea house, which is in the gallery, is a four and a half mat. And you can see the four mats in the center half mat. Um, traditional shape, it's very kind of common and popular. So we tried to represent and continue to, and I think that we're successful in our own hillbilly kind of way, mm -hmm. um, many aspects of the ceremony and with the, with the uh, depth and seriousness that we take to everything, whether it's sure. the space program or... So what, why was the tea ceremony the, 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 um, you know, the important aspect of, of um, you know, human values that you, you would sure. want to infect Mars with? Well, you know, it, there's so many reasons. You know, the, there's the, the sort of four reasons why you do a tea ceremony for, um, you know, hospitality, tranquility, harmony, respect. Um, you know, the, the tea ceremony represents all of the 
um, artistic practices. You know, there's performance, there's uh, religion, you know, or yeah. philosophy anyway with Zen, depending on how you look at it. There's architecture with the house and the, the tea bowls themselves. There's craft, there's poetry in the scrolls. There was a poem on the scroll in the tokonoma, the shrine. Um, uh, it, it's, it's an elite activity. Mm -hmm. It's something that is, is for um, aristocratic or wealthy, um, wealthy Japanese people in the 16th century. And it continues to be, a, a, you know, if you have a tea house in your room, it's a status symbol today. And if, or monks who, have, who sure. are so beyond wealth, they just don't even deal with money. Um, but, uh, you know, so the elitism of that, I love mm -hmm. because I'm an artist, I'm offended by because I'm a consumer. Yeah. Um, but somewhere in between those contradictions is where this, this, this thing lies. And I, you, in a way, you could choose a lot of things to represent what human culture is, but um, I, I like the tea ceremony in it. If I can go on. For yeah. A um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, there are- and just, just by the way, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll walk them through the tea ceremony in the tea garden in, in, in excruciating detail during this conversation. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there are, there, are, there are sort of three main reasons why people go to space or do the tea ceremony. Yeah. Is that a good time for this yeah. bit? Because I think it's, it's a really good one. And this, um, you know, so number one is like philosophy um, or religion, you know, Zen or in science communities, what, where did we come from? You know, what is the origin of life? You know, before evolution, you know, what's the spark of life? And you know, science and religion don't really know how to answer that. But there, there's 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 philosophy and and um, spirituality in that. And then the second reason people are into um, things in general is um, sensuality. In in a tea ceremony, it's the taste of the tea, the caffeine high, the smell of the tatamis. Um, you know, sound, like the beautiful sound of boiling water. If you really obsess over it, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or in the space program, it's adventure. You know, the sensuality of climbing the top of a mountain, putting yourself at risk, adrenaline, all those feelings. And then the third reason people are into both any, any activity is uh, stuff. Um, you know, they're rocket scientists, but they're also rocket engineers. It's way more blue collar. Um, although all my friends at NASA who are engineers are extremely philosophical, you know, they're all PhDs and, sure. and you can't tell who's an engineer and who's a scientist and they cross lines all the time. Um, and, you know, those guys are into stuff because they like rockets because they go boom and they make noise <laughs> and they fly through the air. And when I was a kid, that was the thing. I was, remember looking up the word space in the dictionary with my grandfather and being so annoyed that there wasn't a picture of a rocket. It was just talking about literally the space between atoms or nothingness, which is of course very um, zen in itself. And then of course in the tea ceremony, the, the rocket is replaced with the stuff, the architecture, the tea bowls, the, the whisks, the scoop, the water pot, the kettle, the house, the kimonos, the, and that's what this show is made up of, is all the stuff. And I can't think of a better two things as armatures for me as a maker than the tea ceremony. You know, I get to make 500 chawan. You can see my first 100 experiments in the cabinet upstairs. upstairs. My, those are the cabinet of losers. Um, <laughs> it takes me 100 to make one. Now my average is better. I'm getting one in 20, but that's been five years. Um, and you know, or I get to make a bonsai tree from scratch out of things that are everyday objects and connect with um, things that are part of my life, you know, Q-tips and um, toothbrushes and yeah. stuff. So, uh, so this, you know, this kind of obsessiveness about something, the, um, the tea ceremony in uh, the mission to Mars opened up uh, a, another rabbit hole for you yeah. to a, a new universe in the universe of the Japanese tea ceremony. Um, and clearly, you know, the, the first tea on Mars, which we have memorialized and on display upstairs, um, you weren't satisfied with the cup, which led to all of these. 
So this is a great story. If we go back to the, the um, so I bought that cup on eBay and I engraved the NASA logo on <laughs> and my very close friend, the great artist, the, cer the ceramics master of New York City, JJ Pete, who's an artist some of you may know and w will know after this because you're gonna look him up online. <laughs> um, um, uh, he said to me, um, Shame on you. How could you buy that? Why didn't you make that? And I said, JJ, I don't know how to make a uh, ceramic chawan. And he said, well, I'll teach you. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, oh, I'm a ceramics master. I teach at the 92nd Street Y in Columbia University. And so I started taking classes at the Y. And, that, and I've been working since 2012, say. and making challenges and every morning I including this past couple of weeks here in my hotel room I make before I look at my email before I see um, the horrible things that are happening to our country in the New York Times <laughs> um, I touch clay and I try and do something that um, channels my subconscious thought because the day will get in my emails will get in I can't avoid it all day long and it's, my, it's sort of my meditation that I do every day. So there'll be nine Chawa, Dallas Chawans. Uh, I don't know how many of them will survive. <laughs> That's great. And so you went into the rabbit hole, and you found these two guys. Do, yeah. you, um, you, I, you, do you recognize these images? So I <laughs> this is a test. So. I know that Sen no Tanaka on the right. Mm -hmm. And. And that's Rikyu. Well, is that Rikyu? Well, because uh, I was going to, uh, that would be the logical image, but is that really him? It, well, that, or is, that, that is one of the, of the depictions. This okay. is in uh, the museum in his hometown. So I'm not as familiar with this. With this image. No, yeah. no, no. I know you, you used, I used the other one. Another one yeah. as the basis for the scroll of Muhammad Ali that's okay. in the tokonoma. I just didn't want to assume that was Rikyu no, because no, he had I... Rikyu's uniform. It would have been like, uh, you know, I don't want to say you know, all Asian people look the same, no. but I don't recognize his face, <laughs> right. but that is right. his hat. Yes. And it is his monk's robe. Yeah. And so Rikyu was the monk advisor under Hideyoshi. And Hideyoshi was the, you know, the great unifier of feudal Japan in the 16th century, and he was kind of, he became very powerful. He was kind of like the Henry Kissinger of feudal Japan. And long, horrible story short, he you know, did all these, he got really cocky and he did all these pranks on Hideyoshi, and he was the first guy to tell rich people that it was cool to dress and act like poor people. <laughs> because Hideyoshi wore purple silk, gowns and Rikyu wore brown burlap mm -hmm. and um, the whole tea ceremony is it's really about um, avoiding ostentation mm -hmm. you know have, he was a guy who carved vessels out of out of um, bamboo and he, the for the most fam the most important tea bowl of all um, the tea bowls the dozen or so remaining tea bowls by Chojiro um, Chojiro was a roofer he made like Japanese terracotta, it's called raku ware, but it's basically roofing tile. And he made these terrible lead-lined tea bowls that are the most coveted. In fact, I spoke with a Japanese antiquities dealer and I said, how much do those Chojiro things come up? And he said, well, they never come up and when they do, they're automatically either important national property or, or national treasure, the two rankings of like highest valued objects in Japan. Right. So there, there are none in private hands. And he was kind of the guy who started the Raku school, of which there's a Kichizomon 15th now, there are 15 generations, or 16 I think, I should know, someone yeah. in this room knows, <laughs> um, of descendants of uh, Chojiro, who, uh, whose father was abducted from Korea because um, Hideyoshi in one of his imperialist gestures, in one of his attempts to invade Korea, he tried twice and failed, but on one of the trips he brought back Korean potters and 
and force them at sword point to make Korean pottery in Japan and the, and the and Jap Japan emerged a generation later as a leader in ceramics um, through this this abduction in the same way that they stole um, or took on trips the tea from China and developed it or much later the way um, the sort of um, copied German optics around the time of the war and improved them. And so things that were made by Leica and Zeiss are perfected and made better and cheaper and more plentiful by Canon and, and, uh, and Nikon. Yeah. And then on the right, we've yes. got that Sendo Tanaka, yes. the son of Sendo Tanaka. Sendo's the son, Sendo. Sendo, this is the father. Oh, the father, but the young, you know, the young father, the young photo of the yes, father. Yes, that's right, right. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and so the son, this mm -hmm. guy's son wrote the, they, well, the father wrote a book called The Tea Ceremony, and his son wrote the second edition, The Tea Ceremony. And um, if there was a place somewhere in the bookshop or a learning center, it would be great to have a copy of this. I don't know. Yeah. But, it, but yeah. Jed's got a copy, and you can ask him about it. But it's the Bible of the tea ceremony. It's my McMaster car catalog of <laughs> um, the tea ceremony, the son's version. Um, Dakin Hart likes the father's one because the photography is better, but the second one has more definitions and details. It's more of a, of a, diction, of a textbook. Yeah. And they're both great. So we have the, the, essentially the two, you know, the two fathers of, of, uh, of the modern tea ceremony, Sen, yeah. Sen no Rikyu who's 16th century, kind of codified the Japanese tea ceremony, and uh, Seno Tanaka, who, who wrote the book that made Japanese tea ceremony accessible to the English-speaking world. Um, and so that, that brings us to your, your tea garden. Um, you know, and so I, I'm, I've, I've arranged the images so that we can kind of walk them through um, the tea garden so that they so that you know, they can have a sense of, of um, you know, each, each kind of element. And of course, you know, these things are sculptures that are installed in a sculpture museum. But of course, you know, they serve um, a, a, a ritualistic purpose. Um, and so I've interspersed some photos of you uh, and Dakin from, uh, from the Noguchi Museum. Perfect. So when you hear us refer to Dakin or Dakin Hart, he is the senior curator at the Noguchi Museum who uh, initially organized the exhibition um, there last year. So this is, this is the entrance gate. Um, what, you know, what's, what's the purpose of this kind of liminal separation before you go into the, so the garden? In a traditional tea house, this would be the gate between the house that you live in and the, and the gate to the garden. And the idea here is, in an ideal sense, you've kind of left left your possessions behind and you're beginning to go from your normal world into the extraordinary world or into the um, into a place where you've reduced your um, external inputs um, it's a we'll go we'll go through several gates in this conversation but this is the first this is this is the first gate um, and it leads you into what's called the outer garden. And here, there, there's no one exact perfect tea garden because it, they're always in nature and they're always adaptations. But if you look through the Senno Tanaka's book, you'll see a pretty good um, floor plan of, of all the major tropes. And we represent every one of them. So you might see something like a koi pond. You might see a... Brancusi, <laughs> might see some uh, stones, contemplative stones, a, a, a sand, a, a big bunch of sand raked by monks, all kinds of things. But you'll all, you'll all often also see a um, an outhouse, a place to go to the bathroom, and a place to smoke cigarettes. Um, and that sort of on the, I don't know if we have a picture of it later, but uh, on the, um, that's, a, that's an outhouse, but it's an airplane lavatory from a Boeing 767 that I meticulously crafted out of, out of you know, 
construction barriers and corrugated tin. Um, it's got an incinerating toilet for the waste, and it's got a vacuum cleaner to um, suck the water out of the sink. Um, it works. Please don't use it. <laughs> um, uh, but in a way, you know, that was an object that I've always been really interested in for a number of pop culture reasons um, and also personal reasons. The only place that you can have a sense of privacy for a few moments in a place that we routinely are jammed into this room with 300 other people. Um, but it's also a model of efficiency. It's kind of one of the triumphs of modern design. Um, I even looked at installing one in my apartment um, in a renovation, but it was just too disgusting. <laughs> the, the idea was cool, but um, uh, but then on the left you can kind of see a waiting arbor. I don't know. I don't know what. You know, great. So this is this is an important rest stop, and 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 here you would take off your shoes and maybe put on a pair of shoes from our shoe library, um, and these are some. Nike running shoes that I um, mangled into becoming a pair of slippers. Um, uh, and um, maybe we, you could also have a, have a smoke. There, there's a tobacco bond, traditional tobacco bond, or, or a drink of water. And there's also a Faraday cage. I don't know if, if oh, thank you. <laughs> You're way ahead of me. So this is a very, very important object. A Faraday cage is a is a mesh box that blocks transmission. So you put your cell phone in, in here and maybe your watch and jewel or anything that might distract you um, and distract the other participants in the ceremony. And I got this idea when I was doing a kind of, um, I did a little bit of a residency with the New York Rangers um, around this time and some friends on the team. and. Um, the guy who was in charge of sharpening all the skates and doing repairing all the pads um, confiscated the, the the two cell phones of each of the um, players so that they wouldn't text their wives or their girlfriends in during the in between periods and so there's a saying at the top and you can't really read it but it says two wives and sweethearts may they never meet <laughs> and. And this duality of um, you know secrecy is also a kind of part of my like Cold War obsession of the space program. And you can see two padlocks, and the idea is that you, as the guest, would have one key, and I would have the other key. So at the end of the ceremony, we both have to reunite in order to unlock your. Um, precious, precious cell phone, which <laughs> without which you wouldn't be able to do anything important in your life. <laughs> and then I, I, this is such a beautiful photograph. Yeah. I, I had yeah. to include it, and it's a small thing, but it's it's visible within the um, the shoe library. What's what's the purpose of this of this? So what you're bowl looking at is is a bowl, or it, we used a chow on, um, which is not traditionally perfect, but it's important to remember that with the tea ceremony, if you're going to you know, bust my chops later for getting in, uh, something wrong in detail, and if you look closely, you'll see a lot that's wrong. But it's important with the tea ceremony is adaptation, creative adaptation. And um, some, uh, you know, so using the right thing for the wrong reason is, um, is a Japanese word called mitate. Um, and, um, it also is linked to the ready-made, and people, I'm not the first, I've read it in other places, but there's a great connection between Sen no Rikyu's use of mitate and Marcel Duchamp's use of the ready-made, you know, the, a, a urinal as a fountain, um, a piece of bamboo as a vase. And Rikyu is a famous prankster, and he, in, 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 he, that's the, it's the first recorded um, use of this concept is Riku. So, mm -hmm. um, but this is ash and um, charcoal ash. And in that is buried a lump of red hot charcoal. And with chopsticks, you scrape off the top. And, and those little concentric lines um, are, um, are, are used with a, by a chopstick by hand and, and to um, hide and bury the ash so it stays warm. Um, you know, J Japan had cotton, but it didn't have wool. 
So if you look at all those samurai movies, they're always shivering in these houses with paper walls. And, um, but if you look into it a little bit more deeply, and the best book on that, if you want to geek out, is Edward Morse's um, Architecture of Traditional Japan. It's mm -hmm. like it's like it was a part. Of, he was one of those guys, part of those waves of Americans and Australians who first came to Europe and um, uh, the um, to Japan in the um, at the end of the uh, 19th century, and he kind of got into. Um, describing how these, in very racist terms, how these savages live um, with greater civility than we do in Victorian England. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and one of the things that was done then and in, is traditional is you'd be, as you enter a house, you'd be given a bowl of coals in your hands and you'd maybe put it at your feet with a blanket over it to keep you warm. So there's a tremendous amount of coal stuff going on and this is, Probably the best example of it because it's used just to light up a, a, a pipe. It's a small amount. It also is a. I mean, it, it seems like a, um, a kind of microcosmic evocation of, of Mount, you know, uh, uh, Mount Fuji. You know, because the, the you know the sloping of the of the ash and this this kind of glowing coal in the middle. Absolutely, it's like a little caldera yeah. at the top of of a of a, 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 a dead volcano. Um, and I thank you for reminding me that this whole project is really about these kind of subtle little gestures. I'm thinking about the big picture because I'm trying to you know, familiarize yourself with yeah. it. But that moment, and we were together mm -hmm. yeah. when I was learning it. If you watch this, the, the movie, has anyone seen the um, movie, that world premiere of the um, tea ceremony movie? So All right. what, it's playing. How often and what times? It's playing on the hour every day that the show is running. In this room? In this room. Yes. So you all <laughs> owe me a viewing of this movie. <laughs> um, it's 10 minutes long, and you can see all the stuff up, upstairs in action. Yeah. And there's a moment where I am preparing that, burying the coal. And then there's a moment where my guest is using it to light her pipe. And so in, in this area where the guest kind of m makes him or herself comfortable, changes shoes, has a, has a smoke, can use the lavatory, um, there are also some, um, some artifacts. And artifacts play an important role in, in traditional tea ceremony. You were talking about um, certain tea bowls um, having, having um, such important cultural status um, and that um, and the, the, oftentimes the, uh, the host will select certain artifacts that have various importance or various meanings in order to, um, uh, as, as part of the kind of conversation that takes place throughout the tea ceremony with the guest. So um, these are three objects that could be in, the, there's a shrine in the tea house called the tokonoma. Mm -hmm. and the host would select something as a way of expressing something to the guest. So for example, a lobster in the shrine might represent um, long life because of the, the curve of the lobster's back is like the arch of an old man's back walking with a cane. These are traditional um, tropes. In fact, it, uh, someone who knows the tea ceremony knows that that means that. Or, there's a kabuto helmet, which is a, it's kind of not super traditional to have a war object in that room, but it, you could do anything. It's like, it's a, it could be anything that you wanted to put in there. And, and here is a um, sort of like a samurai's helmet, but I used a, a chainsaw operator's helmet with a feather duster on top. But what's interesting about putting these two things together is in the Meiji period when um, the samurai were obsolete and were rendered illegal. The same craftsman who made this helmet, and you can see there's that neck protector, and it telescopes, it collapses up, and it moves with the, the, the warrior. Um, that kind of layering of lacquer or metal, or in this case, foam core, um, uh, is mirrored in the bronze lobster 
and if we go back, you can kind of see the articulated um, carapace of the lobster um, with it, the telescoping um, segments. Or and here I've just used vice grip pliers and welded all together. This um, the Meiji bronze lobster is one of the most coveted pieces of um, Me Meiji art and design, and um, because it's got like you know a few hundred mo moving parts, it's articulated. Some of you might know the Asprey um, caviar, silver caviar service object. It's kind of like an extravagant um, piece of silver. Um, this is kind of like my version of that, <laughs> and it's 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 crazy detailed. Um, when you pick it up, it flops down just like a um, lobster made by nature. <laughs> and so there, there's also the saw house there, and so the 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 host would arrive before the guest, begin to make prep, prepare the garden, make preparations for it. And there's um, this photograph of you oh, sorry. doing so. Sorry, best photo ever. Um, sorry. <laughs> in, uh, in the, in the um, garden at the Noguchi Museum in Long Island City, where the exhibition first was. So, um, you know, the, and you also get to see him do this in uh, the tea ceremony movie. Um, so that, you know, it's important to show, I, I thought it was important to show not only photographs of the objects, but photographs of the objects in use. Yeah. Um, and then turning towards the, uh, you know, the inner garden, we now have a much larger gate that separates the two of them. Yeah. So we've got one, one um, kind of circle of remove, the outer garden, and then there's another gate, and then you know, another circle of remove is the inner garden. So uh, as you pass through the middle gate, uh, the idea is that you're sort of stripped down. You've, you've lost your cell phone, your jewelry, your watch. Maybe you don't know what time it is. Um, hopefully, you've, um, maybe, if you've, I've offered you b water from the bottom of the well that I woke up at. I collected at dawn when the water's freshest. Um, I'd prepared the kettle. I'd cut the wood. Um, if I go back a few years, I actually grew the tree, harvested the tree, made the made the charcoal out of the wood, made the fire, all that stuff. You know, there are layers upon layers in this. But the middle gate's very important because that's really saying, OK, we, that, leave your problems behind, um, or you've left them behind, and you're in the, the inner garden. And the first thing you see is, you know, well, it sort of depends on the garden. But in this case, you, you know, your goal is to get into the the inner gate, the tea house, but th your view of that is obscured by, in this case, nature, which is the bonsai. And it's a, that's one of the many tropes is don't see the, yeah, the, so you can't see the front door because it's, it's blocked by something. So it's, sight lines are important because they make places look bigger and more contemplative. And of course, there's nothing like nature to contemplate. When I was Becoming an artist, I was at. I had a spiritual experience at Storm King, and I was looking at a Marc de Souvereau and an Alexander Calder, and then next to it was a gigantic oak tree. And I was falling in love with these artists' works, and I was making work. I was kind of emulating them in some ways, but then I saw the tree as a giant lung of the earth, <laughs> instead of you know it was producing oxygen. It was taking carbon dioxide and producing oxygen, and. Um, so I've always loved the structure of trees. There's nothing more formalist or with more formal aspects than a tree, especially when it's lost its leaves. So you can see this, the architecture of the structure. And this bonsai is based on the uh, a black pine that was this, that was kind of the center of focus of the Brooklyn um, Botanical Gardens. It's since died. Um, but there are pictures of it and this kind of cantilevered, windswept design of the, of the bonsai. But this, this, is, it's, this is made of bronze, and, um, but the original maquette was made of cardboard tubes and um, toilet paper tubes and toothbrushes and Q-tips and tampon plungers and um, anal douche tips and things that were meant 
to go inside of your body. I was really trying to get inside of you with this piece. And um, it's the most complex thing I've ever made. It's got a couple thousand parts. And it's resting in a cardboard box. And I chose a cardboard box that was very near and dear to me. It's the box of the Klipsch Heresy, which is the speaker, the official speaker of Tom Sachs Studio. <laughs> um, uh, we don't do any real product endorsements, um, but I like to talk about the things that have history with me. And the, and the Heresy speaker was something that I never had in high school, but my friend, a friend had a pair, and I always coveted them because they were so clunky. They were like a cinder block. And if I were to, and some of them, there's this one called the Decorator series that looks like I made it because you see the end <laughs> grain of the plywood. It's very primitive. And when I buy these on eBay and Craigslist, sometimes I meet the people that sell them, and it's always uh, someone who's recently married and he lost the fight with a wife, and he's like, I "Get those big clunky things out of here." And um, and. I, yeah, no, I don't have any in my house either, but my studio has a dozen of them. And, um, <laughs> but there is something about electronics and in particular stereos that are fancy stereos that are about all about, um, you know, impressing other lonely men and alienating the beautiful women in your life. <laughs> and so I didn't want to miss that opportunity to share that experience as the foundation of this piece. <laughs> And then, of course, in that space also is uh, an important work that has traveled with this exhibition from the very beginning. It's, it's uh, on loan to us from the Noguchi Museum in New York, um, uh, a, a basalt sculpture by Asama Noguchi called Narrow Gate from, from 1981. And, What's in, in, in what, what, what do you feel is its, its role within, within the garden? Well, we couldn't have gotten luckier with this piece. I mean, formally, the shape, it could, it could be that pedestal. Mm -hmm. It could be that heresy speaker I was just talking about. Um, it's really one of the most reduced of the late Noguchi's. And that's, in, in my view, his best work are these basalts. And because some of them, uh, uh, some of the parts are just raw basalt that's like three and a half billion years old, mm -hmm. the, among the oldest rock on Earth, and you know, many people are into basalt for its magical properties. And um, uh, Joseph Boys always used basalt, and uh, there are a lot of we could get into the whole basalt um, issue, and that's what like a lot of the stuff they found on the moon was that. But mm -hmm. you know, for for me, it's it's kind of like the 2001 Space Odyssey monolith of this project. It's the you know it's calling the astronauts there, or but it's also maybe this um, this symbol of imperialism. Maybe the astronauts had so much rocket fuel that they brought this big stone marker to put on the moon or Mars or Europa or the Nasher to say <laughs> you know hey we you know we we've, we've got prowess we're imperialists plunk and what is the, <laughs> those those uh, Mayan markers the uh, the the, are they Mayan? Or the stilo? Stilo. Yeah. And the um, things that you, know, that you might put next to a, to a doorway sure. to indicate power. And sure. So I, I, and I think it's, it's OK that, I, that I'm not deciding which of those three things it is. It, yeah, it yeah. could be all three of them, and it, it works yeah, yeah. in a multivalent way. Yeah. And it's got also this opening yeah. in the middle, which is important because it's, although it's a phallus, you know, it's a standing up thing. It's got a yonic. It's got an opening also. So it's kind of the yin and yang. Sorry, yeah. to, you, I try not to get too, you know. <laughs> and then as, as the guest enters, or as you bring the guest in, there's an important um, ritual that takes place before anyone can enter the, the tea house. And it's, it's at this, this, this small wash basin. Um, it's called a, a sukubai. sukubai. Yeah. And this is a traditional thing that you'll see in people's homes or offices or gardens. Um, as you enter, um, as you go through the middle gate, you, you go through a, a cleansing ritual um, where you wash your hands and your mouth, and then ultimately you wash the, the ladle itself. 
all religions have it, whether it's the, the ablutions of, of the Muslims or the hand washing before lighting the candles in Judaism or the, um, or, or the baptism in Christianity. In fact, some people think that this comes from the baptism that the Portuguese, when the Portuguese first came to Japan, some people think this might come from that. But in any case, it's a, it's a gesture of purification. And water is used often to like clean the rocks in front of the doorways. And here we've got the sukubai. But if you're not into water, you can use Purell. And there's a pump bottle of Purell <laughs> behind it. Um, and of course, you know, this process is something that is meant to take a long time. So, you know, there was the, there was the, the waiting arbor where, where a guest could could change their shoes, and then behind this is, a, is um, uh, another waiting arbor. Yeah. And in fact, there are two waiting arbors in the back of the, uh, in the inner garden. So, I mean, clearly there's an, an opportunity to kind of draw out this, you know, anticipation of uh, before going into the tea house. So yes, this is all about contemplation, meditation, and mindfulness. When you're in the tea house, that it's, it's really all about observing the most subtle things. Like I said before, the, the sound of water boiling. The tea master can know the temperature roughly by the sound that it makes. You can too, if you've tried listening to it. You know the sound of that kettle, of how hot it's getting. And um, you can you know, smell the charcoal burning. You can smell and taste the tea itself, which is this really bitter, I know it's very trendy now. I'm not trying to insult all the matcha drinkers in, in, in the room, but it's a, it's a very, very bitter flavor, and that's why often it's preceded by a sweet. And, um, oh, sorry. Here's, yeah, no, no, here's no. The, yeah. an image of, of uh, um, the curator of the exhibition at the Noguchi Museum, Dagan Hart, um, cleaning the, the, um, the ladle itself after cleaning himself. And then... This is the other waiting arbor that's in the back. And I, I, um, I love this because of the, the, the detail, the, the kind of perfect circle that's drawn on the back. This, this is called um, uh, Full Moon. And this circle I drew in the gallery. And um, it was really a way to, you know, of course, it's the Japanese flag, but it's also a way to break the line and to create a yonic shape versus the X on the floor. And these are the two most primitive marks that you can make, a circle and an X. It's not just tic-tac-toe, <laughs> but there's a reason why those things happen. And it's the sun and it's um, the cycle of life. It's a, it, these are the important symbols, but also to have these most reduced things. I'm always trying to do less. and. In the essay that I wrote about the collection mm -hmm. that I curated, I was always really interested in this arc of nothingness, like uh, you know, um, right? Uh, Rodin uh, applied mayhem and took the heads and arms off of the figures and just showed the trunk, and then his student Brancusi went towards even less of, less of a gesture. It's like very, very simple objects, just the suggestion of a beak or a breast or an eyeball or something. And then he you know, was always trying to get Noguchi to go even more minimal, but they weren't ready. And then if you look over on the other side of the room, you've got you know, Barnett Newman it's here three. This, it's, it's, it's just a piece of structural stainless steel on a very modest uh, pyramid base. Um, and you could see he wanted to make it even less, but he did, was doing the, the smallest gesture that he could. And I think Donald Judd is maybe the, the, the pinnacle experience in that. Or, you know, my favorite piece, which isn't in the collection, is Tony Smith's Die, mm -hmm. which is just a big black cube. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but Judd, in my view, is kind of like the king of that. And 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 I, I did an Instagram live. Um, about it, and I think at one point I said, look at this, it's nothing. <laughs> but it sounded terrible, like I was insulting the piece, but in a sense, I think it was really the, what we're all trying to achieve is, is a state of like how 
little can you get away with doing? And it's something that I'm not good at mm -hmm. because I always have to show a million screws. Yeah. There's that song, you can't take that away from me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm not secure like Marcel Duchamp that says, yeah, you're in a lot of pedestal, like yeah, I'm a genius. Um, <laughs> and backs it up yeah. too, yeah. Um, but I always feel I have to show a million screws and work the thing. Maybe as I get older, I'll get better. And this also, I mean, you, you, you know, you do what your math teacher told you to do. You show your work yeah. in everything. <laughs> yeah. And even here, because you left pinned to the, the side of the waiting arbor, the the, um, the compass. Yeah, the, the compass that you made to, to draw the, the circle. Yeah, and I, I think I could have removed it and left you guessing to see that maybe Tom Sachs is such a genius that he could draw a circle that perfectly by hand. <laughs> but I left the compass there because there's information and transparency in that, and you can see the flaws. And that's essential to what I do, whether it's the weld on a bronze sculpture or the screws, and you can see the two pieces of plywood are joined here. I mean, this is the advantage that the artist has mm -hmm. over industry, that iPhone is the best made thing that it's ever been made. Um, but there's no evidence that a human being was involved in it. And if, and if, and if there, there is, it's not a good thing for it. It means that <laughs> something's wrong. <laughs> um, and um, so that's, that, that's my advantage, and that's what I'm always trying to promote, th those values in the studio. And I love the work of artists who are really like perfect and erase things, you know, like someone like Jeff Koons is, is great, but it's a different kind of yeah. way of telling a story. Yeah. And so, and then this is a detail that of course many people might, might, might miss as they walk through the gallery. It's just the Chiriana or the, the waste bin, which still is, um, explain that. And then th this is an important um, connection to the beginning of, of the, 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 the um, the exhibition at the Noguchi as well. So at the end of, um, or I should say during the preparation of the tea garden, um, the host sweeps the garden and puts all of the, uh, the sweepings, the leaves, whatever, in this trash pit. And then um, finally, the, sort of the last thing to say that the garden is ready, <laughs> a, a branch is placed across the top of it to indicate this is done, and that's a piece of the bonsai that's been broken off, placed across the, 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 the berm as an indication of saying, we're ready. But the filth in there is from the Noguchi Museum <laughs> from two years ago, and there's a little, and you can even see in this photo, there's a little dot that I added for this show is a scrap of blue foam. You can see it right in the middle, <laughs> it fell off, and I wanted there to be um, something that we swept up off the floor of the Nasher in this piece. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, the Mizuya, which is attached to the, the um, tea house where you prepare the tea. Um, it's an extraordinary um, thing, and it's very small, and it has all of the materials that you would need, the host would need to, to make tea and, and other things for his guests. One of the um, fun things about the photos that Johnny took of your tea ceremony with Dakin is that, and here, here, here is the, the tea house and you and Dakin, serving tea to Dakin, um, is that it, you actually see all of these elements um, come together. So right here, we're looking at the elements that are in the tea house that everyone can go up and look through the sidewall and see these at any time. Um, and you've been talking about a tokenoma, yeah. which is this, space right here, and it's, it functions as a, a kind of a shrine, is that right? Yep, so the tokonoma is shrine, mm -hmm. and it, and, but it's the place where the host has his best, because traditionally this, a tea ceremony is done in silence, so the communication between the host and the guest um, is done in this tokonoma, so if I wanted to, like I said before, wish you a long life, you'd, I'd put a lobster in there, um, uh, flower arrangements. Um, of course, the the scroll is the biggest thing of all because it could be a poem. You could actually say something in words, which mm -hmm. is the most direct. But here, I choose three objects um, for the and this for this display. And um, 
It's kind of a long story, but I'll go through all three of them. There's a flower arrangement and we use opium pop, dried opium poppies, because those are the, you know, those are the drugs of choice for the studio, or narcotics. Um, <laughs> fortunately, we can't do them as much as we'd like because we're too busy working all the time. But if we weren't working, we'd be um, doing opium. And um, uh, the cinder block is the symbol of our space program. Um, it's a symbol of imperialism. You know, the first thing you do when you show up in a new country or a new planet is you um, show up with a shotgun and a Bible and you tell them how it's going to be. <laughs> and then um, once they understand that, you um, start knocking down all the round buildings, all the huts and dome buildings, and you start replacing them with rectangular buildings, so, um, um, occidental buildings. that. Um, and the, the symbol of that is the brick, the cinder block. And even this building is built with large, gigantic cinder blocks. <laughs> um, and when we, you'll see in the um, foyer gallery, um, there is a, a perforated cinder block, a cinder block with weight-saving lightning holes. And those, um, that's for when we, we build our space station, our international space station. <laughs> out of cinder blocks. Um, we want to make sure those are light. We're not carrying extra weight into orbit. Um, but lastly, the, there's a scroll. And um, uh, this is sort of to answer any of the haters out there who think that maybe this exhibition is cultural appropriation. Like, a, like another, some of you heard me say this before, um, another middle-aged white guy who thinks that Japan is where it's at. And I know I'm not alone because he's, that's why you see so many koi ponds and, and Zen gardens and Asian second wives. Um, but, <laughs> but, um, and in a lot of ways, this entire exhibition is my J Japanese midlife crisis. I'm going to use like my prowess as a sculptor to like deal with this problem that a lot of men have and um, uh, but I you know I the 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 tea masters that I've met are very appreciative of of the depth that that I've gone to the studio because we go all the way you know hundreds and hundreds of Chawan to display one and tons of research and many trips to Japan and reading and studying and working with people and studying with a tea master and, and really trying to come to terms with what's important. You know, I'm not a great tea master as a server. I'm not James Bond. I'm more like Q, the guy who makes all the weapons for James Bond. I think that's, and I've, I've come to terms with who that, that I am that. And that's, uh, I think that's, that's cool for me. And um, so the scroll is a picture of Muhammad Ali um, in his, traditional, like most famous white robe with black trim and red gloves. Um, and he's uh, in the posture of Sen no Rikyu. So if we went back to that other slide or one similar to it, you'd see that posture. And the quote is, it ain't bragging if you can back it up. <laughs> <laughs> So I, 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 my, my, I, I, I think that we back it up with all of this, this work. And that's why you know, we show all the screws and details, because that's, that's the backbone. And um, so here, these are some images of, of elements of the tea ceremony. Um, you, know, you, you have taken um, uh, traditional elements of the tea ceremony and, and made them your own. So this is a, um, what Dakin likes to call a, a, a uh, refinement on uh, on lacquerware, and it's it's what you call um, uh, resinware. Yeah. Um. So it's it's plywood. Everything is plywood, and um, I'd encourage you to look closely at these objects. And they're resin re and fiberglass reinforced plywood. So <laughs> um, we use this stuff called West Systems epoxy resin. And it's the same stuff they use to build America's cup yachts and spaceships. And the, there's there's a, another element to this which is very important in the in the in the ceremony. Anyone who goes through it, it's the addition of the mag light mm. to the uh, to the the sake bottle. 
Yeah. What, what's the importance of the mirror? Well, here you can see I'm using my hand as a reflector. Um, I'm aiming the, the light. It's because the tea house is always very dim. And, um, and I was spilling sake all over the place, and I physically couldn't see it. <laughs> so I, I put, we mounted a little headlight on the sake bottle that I would reflect with a, my hand in, enough to get it into the bowl. But of course, in pure and total affectation, we always fill the cup beyond its capacity so it overflows into the secondary cup or the saucer. Um, as a traditional way of saying the cup runneth over kind of thing. Um, so I, that it's, it's always a big mess. <laughs> and then uh, here, it uh, looks like Dakin is being served um, uh, one, of the, one of the treats that you offer to your, your guests. So this one is called? Brown Wave. Brown Wave. And right. Brown Wave is the meal in the tea ceremony. Um, <laughs> I'd encourage you to look at the amazing book that we made with Yeju Choi. Mm -hmm. um, she's the book designer. It's an award-winning book, and it's in the gift sh the book bookstore. Mm -hmm. And it's um, it's called the Tea Ceremony. Tea Ceremony Manual. Manual. Oh yeah, I'm Catherine's just gonna got one right there. Pure brash. You know, I don't make any money <laughs> off of this, but um, this is a very complete, expensive, elaborate. I mean killed 10 people to make this book. <laughs> it's great. And there, there are 50 pictures of that brown wave in here. So, um, so very, very simple ingredients, simple presentation, but nonetheless beautiful. A Ritz cracker, um, a, a sloping um, bit of peanut butter that it looks like a wave. You know, I, there's, there's, something, there's something, you know, akin to, I mean, this is, this is very much in keeping with, with, uh, with um, the tea ceremony. Well, Dakin wrote a great haiku, and I, I'm going to screw up the rhythm of it, but it's basically, you know, for, to make one perfect brown wave, there, there are, you have to do it a dozen times to get the wave just right. And um, that makes for happy rats, because we are throwing these, <laughs> these, these things out. And, and there's, a, there's a spread in this manual where it shows you how to make the perfect brown wave. <laughs> and then this looks like... Um, uh, the, this is sun, sun at Midnight. Sun at Midnight, that's right. And this is um, uh, where three Oreos are served to three guests, and um, there's a mirror um, underneath each plate, and that's to check the calibration of the Oreo um, logo that it lines up on the front and the back of the Oreo, <laughs> because Japanese Oreos line up and American ones don't. Ah. So we check that, but it also comes from Bruce. It also comes from, in all fairness, Bruce Nauman's for John Coltrane, where there's a rock on top of a mirror. Right. And then this perhaps is the most sublime of the of the various events that take place. That's a really good picture. Is yes, that John? Jo yes, Johnny. John, yeah, John, no, yeah, so, <laughs> I don't know. They look so like they could be here. All, all these pictures could be and have been here also, yeah. even though this is Noguchi. So this is um, the, when the tin of, and this is one of the, the, that container, that tea caddy there was not made by me. That was made by someone in Kyoto who I bought it from, and it's, and it's very special. Eventually, I will make mine, but this is a lifetime's work. And this, right. this, by the way, work does not end with this show. I will continue until the end of my life working on. There, there are so many elements, uh, but so this is a vacuum sealed um, copper container and copper and tin. And when you pi pull the lid off, it's so tight that it creates this vacuum, and uh, we call it green smoke. And it, it's. It's just a wonderful moment where you see the lighter than air or the particles of the matcha suspended in the air for a few seconds and side lit. And there, there you are preparing tea. Um, the, the, uh, the visage of Yoda yeah. appears in a number of objects throughout mm -hmm. the exhibition. Um, so Yoda, you know, Yoda's... In, Important in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, to me, he's the um, he's the Jesus of Buddhism. Um, 
but people are always like, well, why not the Buddha? Why not Buddha of Buddhism? Mm -hmm. But it's a different kind of thing because yeah. you know the Buddha you're supposed to just kind of ignore, really, and you want to be like him, but you were never him. And mm -hmm. um, but Yoda is a, is a way of connecting the ideas of Zen to popular culture, and he's. I remember reading an article in, in a magazine about some rock star about his his art collection and he said he for years he only collected all things Yoda <laughs> and then once eBay started he kind of got bored with it because it was too easy yeah and he's really for for my generation he was he was kind of also like an Alan Watts figure he kind of helped people come come to appreciate the, the philosophy and of course he's you know he's uh, a sword carrying um, Monk, mm -hmm. so he's a, kind of that school of of <laughs> um, of, of of Buddhism, mm -hmm. and um, and he, you know he only has about ten lines in all of Yoda text. If you like, like there aren't there are only about ten meaningful things he says. Yeah. They're all perfect. <laughs> like um, they're they're. There is no try. Yeah, do or do not. Or there is no there's only there's only do, <laughs> yeah. or do not. Um, and I think that's an important um, thing that I would say to anyone who is struggling with um, a career in the arts. Mm -hmm. um, it's yeah, it, it it's hard. Or um, when Luke Skywalker says, "I'm not afraid to go into that cave." And Yoda says, "You will be." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that moment is just <laughs> don't forget. That's that's cool. You know, to be afraid is yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. very valuable. Yeah. And using the your 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 homemade chasen to whisk the tea, what you, you yeah. you've you've made an important um, uh, Im improvement. You know, because. Um, you have to the, 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 to learn how to whisk the tea appropriately is very difficult. It, they say it takes five thousand attempts, five thousand bowls to get one perfectly right. Yeah. But um, I put a motor on it because <laughs> we're, we're Americans, and yeah, yeah. we get it about eighty percent right on the first try, <laughs> and that's kind of good enough. And I think that represents the level of of degree. It's kind of like a eighth grade level of education. But if you do it across the board, you could run a country. <laughs> <laughs> And then, of course, the tea being served. So I wanted to, you know, we're we're running out of time, and I want, and, and I'm sure people have questions. So I just wanted to run through this. One of the things that we're we're trying to connect with, obviously, there there are, um, you know, the tea ceremony is something that really highlights this kind of distillation to the most essential elements of things, and that's something that's also um, uh, common to to modernism. You know, you were talking about. You know the distillation of form from Rodin to Brancusi to you know Donald Judd, um, and it's something that you find in your work quite a bit. So we we created this this installation as you walk in um, with works from throughout your career that um, highlight different aspects of your engagement with modernism. One of the things that we we were particularly excited about including our these quarter pipes. Um, as kind of another gate, another kind of liminal um, uh, marker of passage um, before you go into um, the, uh, the, the, tea, the tea garden. Well, the quarter pipes are very important to me for a lot of reasons. Let's uh, formally first. Yeah. I mean, these could be Donald Judd plywood sculptures or like the early one with a tube going through it. And they're very simple forms. They're, you know, they're, Traditionally, these forms are used for skateboarding. People build them and skateboard back and forth. And these are, I, I bought these on Craigslist in Arizona. I bought it near my foundry so I wouldn't have to ship them. <laughs> and there's some kid made them in his garage with his dad's help or whatever and got sick of it or whatever, built a bigger one. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we cast them in bronze and they're here 
at the National Sculpture Center as <laughs> sculpture. Yeah. But but there's more to it. The back of them, the, probably there isn't really a picture, but um, we cast the inside, and, and you can see the structure underneath. And that's the that's a private place. That's a place for um, teenage um, sexual discovery, um, <laughs> and and you know for taking a nap, whatever. And and that's kind of like a, it's like a it's like a treehouse or something. Yeah. And I didn't want to miss an opportunity to connect both the um, important, rigorous, formal um, similarities between um, something, a, a skateboard ramp and something of minimalism with the, you know, the pop culture um, or, or the vernacular um, teen architecture of something like this that, where I, that I have probably a greater connection with. Because although I've studied modern art and made a lot of it, I have also had a, a um, tortured childhood, like adolescents, like everybody else in this room. <laughs> Um, and I didn't want to miss the opportunity to try and link those things because yeah. in school we learn one plus one equals two. Right. And in the studio we learn one plus one equals a million. Right. And the hardest thing and the best thing about being an artist is learn to trust your instincts and accept yourself for who you are as a Q and not a James Bond mm -hmm. um, so that you can make just the right wrong decisions. You can have that courage and put, you know, adolescent sex and minimalism in the same object and that's how you get a true expression of the, the individual and then in the middle of the gallery is this baby uh there there's several um, uh, you know uh, uh, homages to um modernist masters who um, many of whom are represented in the collection and, and and this is this is one of them um it's one of the most extraordinary bronze objects I've seen because of the detail and the fact that it actually has all of the screws that have been um, tapped and drilled <laughs> into the yeah, bronze. Yeah. They're stainless. <laughs> yeah, stainless screws tapped and drilled into the bronze. So this, um, I made Brancusi's large cock in plywood and you can see the mosaic pattern is not in Brancusi's original I had I was forced to those shapes so that I could articulate a comp compound curves in linear strips of wood and I made it the same size and this is one that's at the um, Brancusi's Atelier in Paris and I copied it exactly including the base and everything mm -hmm. um, and then cast it in bronze and of course the detail of the screws did not meet my exacting standards so we drilled out every one and replaced 2,000 fake screws with real st stainless screws. So this is bronze and stainless steel, and a little bit of paint, obviously. Um, all the exposed wood grain is represented by uh, liver of sulfate um, patina, mm -hmm. but then the paint is uh, regular you know, oil paint. And the, um, if you get a chance to look, also the base is sonotube. That's concrete tube. I mean, it's bronze, but it's, a, it's a, the, the tube that you, when you make, um, concrete architecture that you pour the concrete into this cardboard tube and you peel it off after. But um, some people leave it on, mm -hmm. which I think is a kind of fantastic white trash form of brutalism, <laughs> you know, because, you know, Corbusier famously left the, you know, the, the concrete dripping out of Unité de Habitation because the form work was done by unskilled laborers and that's part of it. And mm -hmm. later the rust marks of the reinforced holes which of course Tadao Ando made popular by filling them with lead and like, you, you know it's an Ando building or a fake Ando building by those holes. And, um, and I've seen tons of buildings with a sauna tube left on for years and it looks great. <laughs> and then you, you, you made um, your own version of the Barnett Newman that you, that you were talking about before that's in the Nasher collection. Yeah. Um, here three. And so we have the Barnett Newman on view in, in gallery two, one of the works you selected. But then you, you wanted to make your own. Yeah, I just, you know, part of, one of my big motivations in all of this is I've always made things that I've wanted. Mm -hmm. Like I really wanted a Mondrian, but, but I didn't, and then I went down to Wall Street and I thought, oh, I'm gonna have to work with these assholes for eight <laughs> years to get enough money to get my own Mondrian. <laughs> and then so I, you know, I, I went uptown to the Museum of Modern Art and I studied um, 
Broadway Boogie Woogie enough, and I, I went back to the studio, I made one out of Gaffer's tape, a model, a version, mm -hmm. not a forgery, and because I'm very familiar with tape, and I made things out of tape. And I realized that I probably spent more time with that Mondrian than Eli Broad did, the guy who bought it and gave it to the museum, <laughs> because I, had, I studied it, and that was the, the pleasure of art. And, and it really opened, the experience really opened my ideas to, to, to the notion of what authenticity really means. Yeah. I work um, near Canal Street in New York City that um, now sells a lot of fake sunglasses. And I saw like um, Gucci sunglasses that are $500 at Gucci or $5 on the street. And when you leave your $500 sunglasses at a restaurant, you turn your car around 20 minutes and you go back and you get them. Um, and I thought, wow, those sunglasses own you. <laughs> and the $5 ones, you just let go and move on with your day. So those $5 sunglasses have some advantages. I'm not saying they're better or worse. They're just, they're just they're different. Mm -hmm. And so for me to make, um, you know, Barnett Newman is kind of like, he's, an, you know, he's one of these gods of modernism. And he made so few sculptures. Yeah. It's so rare to see one. And um, this represents a lot of the ideas that are in his in his fame in his most more famous paintings. Oh, thank you! <laughs> I've been waiting for this image for six months. <laughs> Fantastic. So, um, j just in case you're 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 confused, um, it's Tom Sachs on the left and Barnett Newman on the right. Thank you. And, and then and then, but I, I wanted to show this detail because. Oh. It's so beautifully done on both works. Yeah. This is an important detail. Yeah. So let's start on the right. Um, Barnett Newman takes a, there's a column. It's a piece of stainless steel, structural stainless steel, three inches by, I don't know, nine inches or something mm -hmm. like that. And then found off the shelf, ready-made piece of industrial stuff. And he welds it to this um, pyramid base that is highly crafted. This is to this does not exist in industry. It's it's um, can Here, I laser? That? Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Um, Your turn around, and it's the top right. button. All right. So um, this pyramid base is made out of probably I don't know thick plate. Can't really tell. It's welded here, but the weld's been ground away, so you have no evidence of how thick it is. And then that's welded to a solid three-inch piece of steel. This is all Corten steel, which is like, like a Richard Serra at rust, but then it stops rusting and stabilizes. And then you can see the edge is flame cut, all jagged there. And um, then this is all welded and then ground away and then allowed to rust. But then it's welded with stainless steel filler rod to the Corten and the stainless. So this is like a magic connection that you never see anywhere except for an only an artist would be ridiculous enough to do something like this. <laughs> and only an artist would have the, the um, structural and philosophical issues where you need to make that kind of thing. Strangely enough, I've seen it in New York City. There are these gigantic plates of steel that are like 10 feet square, and the trucks drive over them, and they sound like explosions. And a 10 foot by square by one inch plate you know, probably costs like $10,000, so to prevent people, and people do steal things like that in New York City, to prevent people from stealing those things with a crane and melting it and selling it to scrap, which happens, the companies that put those plates down weld the name of the company into those sheets of Corten steel, and they use stainless filler rods. So it's like this graffiti hand welded mark. So next time you're in the streets of Manhattan, take a look <laughs> at those things. Um, so, I, and then on mine, um, this is a box made out of plywood that's painted first with, um, with uh, silver paint. We use aluminum paint because it's what shows the filth the most. We looked at stainless steel paint. We looked at um, all kinds of different paints, but aluminum paint is the stuff that looks right. And then we made the pyramid using half-inch plywood and all the screws we showed. And then um, the, uh, the magic joint is... <laughs> Um, it was insane. We built it out of epoxy resin with stainless steel powder mixed into it and buffed it for three days. And if you go into the gallery, I'd encourage you to get on your hands and knees and take a close look at it. Inside this 
frame is a is an elaborate steel structure. I don't know if do we send you pictures of the inside. Yeah, yeah, Sam it's it's like pictures, insane yeah. elaborate. I don't know if Sam's in the room who made it. I don't think so. Um, but oh, oh, she's back there. She back Hi, there, Sam. Sam. <laughs> Good job, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, very elaborate, very, very, very precise. Looks like a bunch of nothing. And I think that's why it's a success. It's like yeah. to do that much work to, to have that yeah. reduced experience. So go to the next one. Oh, let's. So then there's your kiss, which it looks like it's made after the 1916 version, like the, the one at the, at the, um, uh, the Philadelphia Museum. Yeah. yeah. And, and of course, you know, there's the one in the Nasher collection. Um, oh, well, we'll go back. So um, this one is a little bit different from Brancusi's, though. Yeah. Um, it's made out, again, out of plywood and hardware. This is made out of plywood. And, and unlike the Barnett Newman, where we obsess in every possible detail to represent it faithfully, here, I'll admit it, we took a little license. <laughs> and I was, I'll admit, I was influenced by eBay. <laughs> because if you look on eBay, there are a lot of the kiss available that yes. are made in Romania. <laughs> and, um, you know, that just that it's made in, like, it's hard to find things made in Romania. Sure. But, you know, the Nasher's got one, and maybe if you look on eBay, you could have one too. But I, I think there, were, there was a lot of license taken with all kinds of um, not authentic um, Brancusis. But again, by building it in plywood, um, you can see the end grain, you can see the screws. It's not a forgery in any way. We're really trying to adapt it into the language of the studio that we've been working on for 30 years and show it on a, on a, on a cinder block base. And, but to you know, have all the important tropes of the, you know, the interlocking gaze, the arms wrap of the lovers wrapping around each other, and then like there's the very subtle distinction of sexuality with a breast on one side and long and short hair to represent man and woman on the other. But I think, I was really trying to represent some of the ideas that we have in the, in the curation of the permanent collection where I'm trying to really talk about ideas of reduction and simplicity and, and to take, uh, of taking away. Let's jump. I'm going to, sorry. Yeah, 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 please. Yeah. So David Smith, you included in this. He's very important to you because of the, the kind of legacy that, that you know, you, you, grew up kind of imbibing. Yeah. So I, I went to Bennington College. I made sculpture on his anvil. Um, I think it's possible that I, you know, I have a pair of his pliers that I inherited that are hidden somewhere, somewhere in this exhibition. I'm not going to tell you where. Um, uh, and it, here's an artist who made sculpture using um, found industrial things, objects of, of the Rust Belt, the things that were showing the agricultural and, and industrial decline of America. And these are, these are ideas that are still alive in my work. And um, he's also someone who was conflicted personally with class issues, where you know, he came from an affluent, educated background, yet was working as a blue collar guy. These are issues that we don't have time to get into now, but yeah. are still alive with me and the studio represents constantly. Um, and then this was important for you to include as well. What is it about this one? I mean, Giacometti is fantastic, yeah, but yeah. what is it about Diego in the sweater? Well, I mean, besides just being the best thing ever, yeah. and I could almost leave it at that, the yeah. things that appeal to me about Giacometti, and in particular Diego in the sweater, is it's a supreme nugget. Right. Um, this is a gold nugget. This is an object of intense density. Nuggets is like a slang that we use in the studio, like a gold, a gold nugget, a meteor. I have, a, I have, a, I have a, a rock that came from outer space that's made of iron, and it's like a coveted thing. Um, and you know, it's all melted from entering the atmosphere. Uh, and and there, there's so many things about Giacometti, you know, his touch that this must have been terribly shocking at the time. The the um, the surrealist distortion. Although I never think of Giacometti as surrealist, it, sure. it is, yeah. and um, the the roughness of you know the the ca ca what seeming seems like a casual approach to marking, mm -hmm. where he, it appears to have been done very quickly. And I, you know I don't know I wasn't there, um, uh, but there's tremendous refinement in this uh, this combination of rough and smooth and finding just the right balance is uncanny. I don't really have the language to talk about it other than yeah. if I could 
um, get a cast of this and make it in plastic with the same detail and sell it at Kmart so everyone could have one. <laughs> I think it would be a hap it would be a, it would be a cool thing to do. <laughs> just because because it's it's the it's the form. Yeah. It's got it's just perfect and it's so. Yeah. <laughs> and then you picked this too, which I thought was interesting. This is a, a, a bronze cast of one of de Kooning's very first sculptures that he made. It's about about that big yeah. in 1969. I picked this um, because I thought it was heroic. As displayed now, it's in it's in a vitrine horizontally, yeah. which is a much more humble position. But I, yeah. this is kind of a something in this position that I love as the as an abject mark. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be a bone, it could be like a drumstick or something. It's very, very primitive. It looks really casually done mm -hmm. and thrown off to the side. You know, like de Kooning's gestures in his paintings. They're yeah. done with, with speed and vitality and there's something very um, uh, quick about it. Of course, once you cast almost anything in bronze and finish it right, mm -hmm. it can be the most heroic, beautiful thing. And I, I think this photo mm -hmm. is, is better than the um, sculpture itself <laughs> because of the scale. Yeah. It's much bigger. This, the sculpture is probably nine inches long. Um, and also it's displayed horizontally versus vertically. I think it should be displayed like this, where mm -hmm. it could be an, an high and a pedestaled head level so you could get into the subtlety. Because it's a little bit like nature. If you look at a fistful of dirt mm -hmm. or a cloud. There's nothing more beautiful. And you know, when, when Pollock, his contemporary, says, I am nature, you know, yeah. that's what he's talking about is all those little folds. And that's also what you see when you look at the detail on a, on a Giacometti. Um, well, and I included this because yeah. there seems to be you know, a, a lot that resonates, um, you know, a lot from Calder's work that resonates in your work. That, yeah. The kind of dedication to hand making, the, you know, the, the the sense of engineering that goes into it, you know, um, and also the the kind of very, you know, very simple beauty out of those that you get out of those forms. Well, Calder was a great engineer, yeah, and I'm becoming an okay engineer. I mean, I've yeah. got like enough knowledge to really hurt myself at this point, <laughs> and. Um, uh, I, I admire his engineering, and I, I, I love it. I love the technical side of, of what I do. It's, mm -hmm. it's a, you know, one of the great parts of my job is to um, educate and entertain myself. Yeah. And learning about physics and of how materials go together is, is really great. And this is an incredible piece, Spider. Yeah. Well, I, I, we've, I, the, the great thing about having Tom here is, you, you know, you can ask him lots of questions and you don't want to let him go. And that's been my problem because I've, I've <laughs> se severely gone over our time limit. Um, and I don't, Tom, if you're, if you're not too tired, we could open it up to maybe one or two questions. But sure. actually, rather than doing that, why don't we just ask questions with a drink in our hands? Because yeah. we've got that just outside the auditorium. So I want to thank you for, for staying with us the whole time. Thank you. And Tom, thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>